Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff, the great stuff, uh, the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I'm very happy to have Carver Beerson with us today. Hey, Carver. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? I, let's see. It is uh, July 15th, uh, and it's a relatively cloudy, a booby type day here in Phoenix. Uh, so we won't get as hot as we normally would. And I say we because I do believe that we are at the same institution, Carver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's nice to have a little bit of a break from uh, the heat for the last few. It is. Years. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's uh, always welcome when we get a little desert rain every once in a while, so it's pretty good. So what, what, is your, uh, what is your position at Arizona State University there? I am a postdoc uh, in the department, and mostly my work is focused on studying the asteroid psyche in anticipation of the upcoming psyche emission to go uh -huh. there. Very cool. In fact, I think what we're going to be talking about a little, we'll have some, some bearing on that a little bit. Um, so very good. So what, what in general do you like to do research on? My research tastes are very eclectic, and I okay. tend to hop all over the solar system. Uh, I've looked at Earth's moon. I spend a lot of time on icy worlds nice. uh, in the outer solar system, looking at Pluto and its neighbors. And as I said, right now, I'm also looking at uh, at Psyche and also Mars polar caps as well. Ooh, yeah, right. There's a topic. Very cool. Very nice. And so that is going to bring us to this very lovely open access planetary science journal article, PSJ, on tidal heating did not dry out EO and Europa. And Carver, take us away. Yeah. So this is a a really kind of fascinating question that, and this is the second work that I've done on this topic of why Io and Europa uh, look so different from their neighbors, Ganymede and Callisto. Mm -hmm. So Jupiter has these four large moons, the four large Galilean moons. Io is essentially entirely rock. Mm -hmm. Europa's mostly rock, it's like 90% five percent rock by mass and then in the outer part of the system Ganymede and Callisto are 30 per or 70 percent rock by mass so that's 30 percent of their mass is ice mm -hmm. presumably water ice uh, but but why and they're in this very particular order where your closest moon Io close to Jupiter is your rockiest and as you get farther out you get more ice rich uh, and this is something that's been known for decades, but without uh, like any, I'll say like one agreed upon answer. There's lots of ideas that have been thrown around. And one of those ideas that's been mentioned in literature is, well, maybe tidal heat did it. When you look at these worlds today, you look at Io, it's covered in volcanoes. Um, it's the most volcanically active world in the entire solar system. And it makes for beautiful images because of that. It has all these oranges and reds all over the surface. Uh, so could that heat that's being pumped into it from tidal heating over all of solar system history uh -huh. have removed enough water ice to cause this difference in composition? Okay, okay. And that's the question that we wanted to get at. This is a question that myself and my co-author, Gregor, uh, were talking about at lunch at a, at a conference. And we, we couldn't agree on what the answer was. And so we decided to look into it in detail, see if we could figure this out. Dare I ask if that was an in-person conference? It was. This would have been, uh, I think, February before everything uh, shut down, yeah, uh, or maybe a little bit before that. Okay. Um, yeah. So one of the last in-person conferences I went to, and it's one of the things I miss most about conferences is just having lunch with somebody and then mm, having a good research problem. idea come out of it. Yes. Yes. Well, soon. Soon. We hope soon things will return to that mode. Yeah, so if you scroll down to the first table here. Okay. 
So table one on the left there has the uh, size and the bulk density of, of these moons. And this is kind of getting at what I was just saying. So Io has a really high bulk density and essentially zero ice yeah. mass fraction. Mm -hmm. And it gets higher as you go out. Okay. And one of the reasons that we thought this idea might work is if you say, all right, well, if we take Io as it is and just start adding ice onto it until its composition looks like Ganymede or Callisto, okay. we'll call this our icy Io case. So that's the one below the line. Talk about terraforming. This is great. Yeah, we're going to add a, just <laughs> mountains of ice, huge amounts of mass. The radius that Io gets to be is similar to the radius of Ganymede and Callisto. It looks like it's about the same size. Yeah. And so it feels somewhat reasonable that if you, you know, took Io or like Ganymede or Callisto and you, you moved it into where Io is, that's the other way to do let it. it sit there, maybe that, that's okay. what happened. Okay. Uh, so how, how do we go about testing this then? Uh, we wanted to take a, a kind of first order approach, uh, energy balance approach to all this. Essentially, we're trying to test if this is reasonable at all in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. and, and the way we did this say, is there enough energy? There's a, this is a lot of mass of ice that I would have started with. It takes a lot of energy to get that ice off of the surface of Io, and that energy has to come from somewhere. Yes. Is there enough? Good. So if you scroll down to table two there, This is our, our uh, kind of starting place for these energy estimates. Okay. So the, the first line is the um, a total mass of ice that we're trying to get rid of. Yeah. You know, we're saying it started with the same mass fraction as mm. Ganymede and Callisto. All right, this is our number. We got to get four times 10 to the 22 kilograms of ice. Mm -hmm. And the next two lines are the energy requirements to get rid of that. The first is the, the gravitational energy, because you have to move it off of the surface of Io and get it at least far enough away that Jupiter will take care of it yeah, we'll for the rest of the way. Sponge it up. OK. Yep. And if you're removing this ice, uh, most of the ways you're going to do it, you're not going to be like chopping off blocks of ice and then carrying it away. You first have to turn it into a gas and get rid of it that way. But turning ice to gaseous water vapor takes a lot of energy as well. And so that's what that, that second energy term is there. And it's uh, less than the gravitational component. Um, for Europa, they're about equivalent. Yeah. For Io, it's about an order of magnitude less. And that's because Io is bigger. Io has more gravity. So it takes more work to get rid of the ice. Yep. Okay. All right. So that's the number we need to get to. It's like 10 to the 29, 10 to the 30 joules of energy. And then the second half of this is uh, kind of sources we might get that energy from. Uh, first one is just the incident solar flux. And that's uh, so this light from the sun that gets to Io and Europa. That's not very good for like doing work in terms of removing material, but it kind of sets the background surface temperatures and it's a good reference point for these others. It's because of this solar light that Io and Europa have basically mean surface temperatures of around uh, 100 degrees Kelvin. So we also have modern day estimates for what the geothermal heat flux is on Io and Europa. Uh, for Io, it's about two watts per meter squared. And for Europa, it's a tenth of a watt per meter squared. And for Europa, that value is much less certain than it is for Io. Io, we can see all these volcanoes on the surface and measure the amount of heat coming out. Yes. Europa. We don't have as good measurements, so that's kind of a high number because I'm going to be pretty generous in saying, all right, well, let's assume there's more energy 
available to us than might be the case. And almost all of that energy in both cases is coming from tidal heating for Io and Europa. Yes. So that's what that, the next value, that H value is. So for Io, it's 10 to the 14 watts. For Europa, it's basically 10 to the 12. Okay. And again, that's pretty generous uh, large value. 10 to the 11 might be more the case for Europa. We'll see when Europa Clipper gets there. Then we'll have a much better number. Sure, yes, we will. Yes, we will. So if we want to get the total, we can take the heat production at Io Europa, at least as a first pass, and multiply it by the time that the solar system's been around. Yep. 10 or four and a half billion years. And we get a total amount of energy dissipated. For Io, it's 10 to the 31 joules. And that's bigger than our 10 to the 30 joules that we needed to get rid of. Right. Right. We basically have one order of magnitude difference between those. Yes. And for Europa, it's a similar thing. It's uh, you know, basically one order of magnitude, actually maybe a little bit less than that for Europa. It's a pretty tight margin. So this is saying that from tidal heating, there is enough energy, it looks like. So kind of a first pass. There's enough energy to do it if you're really efficient. Yes. In how you do it. Yes. And this sort of calculation had been done by some authors in the literature in the past. And I said, you know, it looks like it's possible, but it raises this question of how energy efficient can you be with removing this material? And that's the question that we're trying to address through the rest of the paper. Okay. There's going to be one question of make sure we have the right number for the amount of energy dissipated, and then look at the energy efficiency that we can get for these loss processes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the other numbers in that table are mostly just reference. Things like radiogenic heating don't matter that much. It's just, there's not that much energy there compared to tidal dissipation. Right. Okay. So if we may want to go up to the first figure here. Uh, next table is just describing what's going to be in the next figure anyways. So, so this is a, a check for essentially uh, that tidal heating number that we gave before. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that, uh, so the, the tidal heating, let's think about IO for a second. Tidal heating depends on the orbit that you're in. And it also depends on what your moon is made out of as you change the composition or change the temperature of the material, yes. you can change how efficiently you're dissipating energy. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Io starting out with a really big ice shell on top of it. And so we want to make sure, well, if you added that really big ice shell, could you dissipate a lot more energy? than IO does today, get this extra energy source mm -hmm. that IO doesn't have. And so that's what we are trying to figure out with this figure. Now, ice is kind of funny when it comes to tidal dissipation because it's really efficient. Ice, especially um, at these kind of frequencies that the IO and Europa are orbiting Jupiter, ice has good rheology, uh, good material properties for dissipating this energy. But as you dissipate energy, as you warm up your ice, it melts to water. And water is much less good at dissipating tidal energy. And then you have less ice, less volume of material to dissipate in. Right. So as you dissipate more energy, you get less and less ice because you keep melting it. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it becomes insignificant because you just don't have enough ice left. It's mostly water now. You melted it all. <laughs> yes. So we have two curves here. The red curve, uh, so this is, a, is how much energy you're dissipating okay. as a function of the ice shell thickness, which is the, the bottom axis here. And the blue curve is how much heat the ice shell can transport out. And where these cross is going to be your equilibrium. Yep. And it's right way over there on the left. Here's at it. less than a kilometer thick. Right. 
And essentially what's happening is that Io in its rocky interior already dissipates so much energy that if you stick an ice shell on top of it, that ice shell has to be so thin in order to accommodate the amount of energy that it's trying to get out. Yes, understood. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. And so that thin ice shell doesn't really dissipate any more energy than just having the rocky interior by itself. Yes. You haven't really, you're not able to get more energy out of the system by having this ice shell on top. Okay. Yep. Other groups in the past have looked at, well, would Io and Europa have dissipated a lot more energy in the past because of like orbital changes and things like this? Sure. And it seems like the past values are probably at least pretty close to the current values. Okay. You know, there, there are variations over time, maybe a factor of three or something like that. Okay. But in terms of this bulk order of magnitude analysis that we're doing, where we want kind of the mean over time, we're probably okay with using the current values. Uh, at least within a factor of a few, which is good enough for what we're trying to do. Understood. Understood. I'm with you. Uh -huh. All right. So now we're going to shift and talk about uh, our escape mechanisms. All right. So we know how much energy we have. We know how efficient we need to be. How are we going to get rid of the water ice? And the first uh, thing we talk about is geysers. Yeah, we see geysers on Enceladus spewing material into space. Yep. Around Saturn, this forms this beautiful E-ring of material that's clearly left Enceladus. But Enceladus is a lot smaller than Io and Europa. Mm -hmm. Enceladus is a few hundred kilometers across. Io and Europa are both uh, a few thousand kilometers across. So you have, you're an order of magnitude bigger, which means you have a lot more gravity, which right. means it is much, much harder to get material to escape velocity, to get it to leave. Um, and that just ends up being a huge problem in trying to use geysers to get material to uh, actually leave right. the gravity of these moons. Yep. You would need to be erupting material from Io Europa at kilometers per second yeah. from yeah. the surface. <laughs> so we're talking like rocket exhaust yes. from the surface spraying into space in order to make this work. Mm. And that's just to get it to leave. Like we're, we're not even talking about the energy concerns at this point. Like right. it's just to get it to leave at all. Uh, I can't imagine that system is very energy efficient. If you even somehow could possibly imagine a geologic system that does it, and you need to do it for billions of years. Yeah, that's quite a squirt gun. Yeah. So geysers are beautiful, but I don't think they're a way you're going to get much mass off of Iowa and Europa. Okay. All right. So. Your genes. Yeah. What about atmospheric escape? Yeah. Atmospheric escape is nice because it's a continuous process that can act over all of solar system history. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we know it's happening at Mars and we have MAVEN mission there collecting beautiful data about how it's impacted both water and CO2 ice on Mars over solar system history. Um, there are other mechanisms of atmospheric escape. Maybe I'll touch a little bit on those uh, after this. But genes escape is usually like the central when we think about it. It's thermally driven escape by individual atoms in an atmosphere that are moving faster than the escape velocity. Yes. So uh, because genes escape is uh, fairly well characterized, people have studied a lot of different settings, we have these. Uh, equations for the escape rate mm -hmm. as a function of the the pressure of the atmosphere. Uh -huh. Yes. And really, we're talking about like the pressure of the atmosphere, kind of at the top of the exabase, where things are free to move and they're not going to run into somebody else on their way out. So that's what equation equation two there it is. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on the temperature of the atmosphere, because as you're hotter, your molecules are moving faster. You get rid of stuff easier. Um, and then the pressure, how much material you actually have. So what we could do is, is take this 
and say, well, we know how much mass we need to get rid of. We have that number that we talked about earlier on. We know how much time we have to do it. We have solar system history. Um, so if we take that total mass divided by solar system history, that gives us a minimum escape rate that we need. Yes. <clears throat> if it escapes faster than that, that's great, but that's gonna be harder to do. So we have a minimum escape rate. And then we could solve for what pressure the atmosphere would have to be okay. to get rid of atoms at that fast for a given temperature. And that's what figure two is, if you scroll up a little bit. So the orange and blue lines are the minimum pressure the atmosphere would have to be for a given temperature in order to get rid of material fast enough. Okay. So the blue is Io mm -hmm. and the orange is Europa. Yep. Io is bigger, it's got more gravity, so you have to have a higher pressure. Yep. And you also have to get rid of a little bit more mass as well. Indeed. So surface temperatures of Io and Europa today are about 100 Kelvin, which is way there on the left of the plot and it requires surface pressures that are like above 10 to the 10 pascals. The Earth's surface pressure is 10 to the 5. Uh, 10 to the 9 is the pressure you get if you took this entire ice shell that's 30% of the mass of these moons and put it in the atmosphere all at once, which is an insane upper limit that couldn't yeah. physically pos happen. Yes. And that's still not enough pressure okay. if maintained over solar system history to lose this at 100 Kelvin. Okay. At 100 Kelvin, it's cold. Your yeah. molecules are not moving fast. They yeah. don't want to escape. Right. That's an exponential. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's really hard. So well, yeah. let's, let's warm up our atmosphere as we move to the right. And the pressures come down dramatically. As you said, this is an exponential here. Um, at some point, we cross this green curve, which is the saturation vapor pressure for water. Yes. So if you imagine that your surface uh, of Io or Europa is covered with like liquid water at you know 270 or 300 Kelvin, you would have a pressure of say a thousand or so mm -hmm. pascals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you might actually be able to make this work. Uh, you would have uh, this warm surface, you'd have liquid water essentially feeding molecules into an atmosphere yep. that would be if you, you know, thinner than Earth's, but thick enough that it's driving off these warm, this warm fraction of the water. Mm -hmm. The problem is you need to have a surface of water at 250 Kelvin for all of solar system history. Problem. And that takes a lot of energy. <laughs> So essentially, if you moved I or Europa to Earth's orbit much closer in the solar system, okay. you could make this work. Uh, they would lose a lot of water over solar system history. Mm -hmm. You could have an analogous story to something like Mars, which has right. lost a lot of its volatiles over solar system history. Right. Uh -huh. But out of Jupiter, it's cold. Yes. So we, we try again to make this work. We say, OK, well, what? if it's not the surface feeding water? What if we have this a little bit more complicated system where we have warm water in an ocean and it's being erupted through geysers right. to form an atmosphere and that atmosphere is warm okay. because it's just come from the ocean and then it can escape. Okay, okay. What's the, the energy efficiency of this kind of warm atmosphere that's escaping. And essentially there's a competition, right? That we want to be using this energy to just have molecules leave the system, but those warm water molecules are also radiating thermal energy to space. Yeah. And how efficiently you do that depends on essentially the emissivity of your atmosphere. So how thick your atmosphere and how warm it is. And that, that rate at which you're leaking atmosphere to space is that uh, sigma t to the four term down there. So also as you get warmer, 
you start radiating energy a lot more efficiently. So if you go to the next figure, uh, this is the energy efficiency now on our vertical axis Ooh. versus the, the temperature of our system. Yes. Uh, and the dashed horizontal lines are the energy efficiency we needed back from that first table in our ideal situation. So if you're above the dashed line, okay. the energy efficiency is good enough that you could maybe possibly make this work. Uh -huh. Where the blue line is that 3% for IO and the orange line is 30% for Europa. So those are color coordinated with each other. Yeah, they are. OK. Uh, so we can start with Europa since it's a little more on the left here. So what this is saying is that on the left hand side of the plot, it's really energy inefficient because we needed these huge amounts of pressure uh, to get the escape rate we needed. And if you have a really thick atmosphere with a lot of pressure, it's optically thick. It's going to radiate all that energy away. Yes. Okay. As you go to the right, your atmosphere gets thinner and thinner and thinner until it's so thin that it's not actually radiating that much energy itself. Mm -hmm. And so then you can possibly make this work when you cross that line. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have a Europa, there you have an ice shell. You have geysers constantly erupting material to form a warm atmosphere with sufficient pressure that it's constantly escaping okay. over all of solar system history. Maybe can technically make this work. And that's essentially like the one case that we could find. Okay. Now, I, I say constantly erupting. Uh, a number of years back, there was a observation for Europa, where using the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, there was at least tentative evidence that they're seeing some sort of geyser erupting off the surface. Yeah. Uh, and there's ongoing work to try and confirm that and understand uh, what was there. If we take those initial estimates for how much water was in that geyser, which they were thinking was a very big geyser eruption. Okay, it will be seen, yeah. Uh, we need something like, uh, maybe I should check the paper for the exact number here, but millions of those a year. Okay. Essentially, you need a constant stream of these always erupting yeah. to deliver enough mass to the atmosphere to sustain it as it's losing mass to space. Uh, for Io, it's even worse because you need to have the atmosphere be even warmer than sure. Europa because you're farther off to the right. Right. So it, it's even harder. Yes. Doesn't get any easier. Yep. And, you know, there's some other things that you think maybe could help. Like um, Io today is losing some mass because of interactions with Jupiter's magnetic field. Uh, that strips away some of Io's uh, atmosphere, which today is largely SO and SO2, these products of volcanic outcasting. But those mass loss rates are three orders of magnitude smaller than the kind of mass loss rates we need. Yeah. And there's no clear way to make it that much more efficient to increase the, the rate by three orders of magnitude, which is a, a huge amount. So in the end, we kind of come to this situation where we have a, a really extreme case for Europa, which maybe technically works on paper, but I can't imagine it actually ever happening in nature. And no real case for Io that looks okay. halfway reasonable. Mm -hmm. So our conclusion was that, well, then they probably didn't lose this mass over solar system history. Right. Yeah, they're probably formed like this, okay. you know, from the time that formation stopped and we kind of entered whatever kind of normal was going to be for the solar system history. They haven't changed that much in terms of their bulk composition. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit here or there, you know, maybe 1% or less, sure, but not tens of percent of their total mass being lost. Yeah. Okay. 
And I, I like this answer a little bit because it means that the, the composition of these moons today tells us something about how they formed, about the conditions in which they were forming. Uh, what exactly that is, we're still piecing together as a community and there's different ideas out there, whether it's you know material being lost before it was ever accreted or these were forming in a really warm disk. So maybe material got accreted and then it was lost really fast during formation when things were much warmer. Uh, in their uh, environment there as they formed around Jupiter. Cool. So. All right. Harbor, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your, your lovely letter here. Um, so you kind of hit a little bit there at the end um, on different ideas that people may have. Uh, perhaps there's other sources or they were just born that way and how were they just born that way? Um, uh, but where do we go, let's say, over the next five years, you know, as a community? Are there are there new observations that could be done, maybe with JWST or new satellite missions going up? Are there additional, um, perhaps promising theoretical avenues to investigate? And just where, where do we where do we go with this? Well, the exciting thing is that in the next decade, we're going to have Europa Clipper get out here. And so I think kind of in this time beforehand, what we need to be thinking about as a community is generating predictions. Mm -hmm. You know, is there any way to test these different ideas when we actually get the spacecraft out there to Europa? Um, Europa Clipper has some S spectrometer on it. They may be able to measure the uh, isotopes of the ice. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so I've made some predictions for some of these ideas about how the isotopic ratios might be different mm -hmm. between some of these formation uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to kind of look at the other ones too and see like, what are the predictions for those? Okay. How different are they? So that when we make the measurements, uh, you know, in the mid 2030s, we can separate these out and really, you know, see what it is, see what the real answer is. Very nice, very nice. Yes, much better to put predictions out than postdictions of uh, uh, what the value is. Um, it'll probably be work. something totally different that no one predicted, right, and that'll exactly. be an exciting exactly. challenge too. Exactly, and so then it becomes a postdiction game. Um, but yeah, very cool, very nice. Uh, lots of uh, lots of activity in this uh, solar system of ours over the next decade or so. It'll be really cool. All right, uh, that'll do. Carver, I want to thank you again for walking us through your paper. And everyone, thank you very much. I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks.